This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking on the link in the description. As if it wasn't bad enough already that people have fallen ill from the coronavirus, businesses are closing, quarantines, and some states are on complete lockdown, now we have senators allegedly profiteering off of this worldwide pandemic. Four senators have now been alleged to have engaged in insider trading by liquidating or trading stocks just weeks before a massive sell-off in the market due to coronavirus panic. Senators Richard Burr, Kelly Loeffler, Dianne Feinstein, and Jim Inhofe have all been accused of selling stocks after getting inside information. Two of the four, Burr and Loeffler, took part in a classified and non-public hearing regarding the coronavirus and its looming impact. Those two senators, Richard Burr, a senator from North Carolina and chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and Kelly Loeffler, a newly appointed senator from Georgia, sold significant amounts of stock at the same time they were receiving non-public classified classified information about the severity of the coronavirus and its potential devastating impact worldwide, at the same time that they may have been downplaying the effects of the coronavirus to the public. If these allegations are true, is this a crime? Well, we're about to find out. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer and maybe get out the pitchforks and guillotines because it might be time for some senatorial heads to roll. Today, we're going to discuss what happens when senators abuse their position and profit off of a massive tragedy. Or is this all just a big misunderstanding? Now, to better understand what senators Burr and Loeffler are being accused of, it'll be helpful to have a little background as to what insider trading is and how it developed into its current form. The Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 was enacted with a desire to promote fairness and clarity in the federal securities laws for all participants in the financial market. Section 10B of the Exchange Act was intended to be the Exchange Act's broad anti-fraud provision designed to cover the full range of fraudulent conduct that, quote, human ingenuity can devise. Of course, humans are very ingenuitive when it comes to defrauding other people. The Supreme Court has recognized that 10B was designed as a catch-all clause to prevent fraudulent practices. Now, it's from this statute that the concept of insider trading was born. Although the concept of insider trading emerged in the 60s, it really wasn't until the 1980s that the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed that insider trading was in fact a violation of Section 10B. After insider trading was deemed illegal, what developed were sort of two types and reasons for insider trading, the classical theory and the more expansive misappropriation theory. Now, the classical theory of insider trading specifically holds that corporate insiders are liable when they use material non-public information obtained from their unique position within a corporation for their own personal advantage in the securities market. As the SEC has noted, there is an inherent unfairness in allowing a corporate insider to use non-public information to the detriment of other innocent investors in securities markets. The Supreme Court has reasoned that an individual must refrain from trading securities on the basis of non-public information because of their fiduciary relationship with shareholders as a corporate insider. Now, that really only applies to corporate insiders, and you can imagine that there's all kinds of insider trading that uh, doesn't actually involve someone inside the company itself, which is why the Supreme Supreme Court later adopted what's now known as the misappropriation theory of insider trading, which extended liability to certain corporate outsiders that traded on confidential information in breach of some duty owed to the source of information, not necessarily the shareholders themselves. The Supreme Court has held that under a misappropriation theory, an individual breaches a duty to the owner of confidential information by using that information to his or her advantage in the stock market. It's called misappropriation theory because it's kind of like stealing. You are taking information that doesn't belong to you and using it for your own advantage. This often comes up in what are called tipper or tippy cases, essentially one who receives an inside tip and trades that non-public information received from a tipper. They're liable under Section 10B of the Exchange Act regardless of whether or not there was any benefit to the person that provided the tip itself. Now that's all in the corporate context, but what about members of Congress? Congress people are privy to a whole host of classified and non-public information that most of us are completely unaware of. They're not corporate insiders in the classical sense, but they still have information at their fingertips that can easily be used for their own personal gain. So what happens when someone in Congress makes an investment decision in the stock market based on this potentially classified or top secret information? Would they be liable under some form of insider trading? Well, the answer for a long time was effectively no. Congress basically had this absurd loophole that made insider trading legal and 
even above board with congressional ethics rules. This is what happens when the rule makers make rules about themselves. And the statistics show just how advantageous this was for them. While traders were beating the market by approximately 5% and hedge funds by 7 to 8%, in one study published by the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis, it showed that Congress people were beating the market by an astounding 12%. And what's even more astounding than their returns is Congress's brazenness with which they were cashing in. Former Senator John Kerry is a prime example of cashing in on non-public information. For instance, on May 15, 2007, the government ended reimbursements of an obscure anemia drug manufactured by Amgen, which caused the company's stock to tank. But you know who sold all of their Amgen stock just days before? Yep, that's right, former presidential candidate, Senator John Kerry. He avoided almost any loss by selling all of his stock on May 4th and May 5th, just days before the reimbursements ended. Impeccable timing, of course. Kerry had similar good fortune when it came to the rollout of Obamacare. Kerry was a member of the Senate Finance Committee's subcommittee on health and played a key role in developing President Obama's health care reform legislation. It isn't about eating broccoli folks. And just prior to the enactment of the ACA, Kerry bought stock in big time winners uh, that resulted from Obamacare, such as pharmaceutical companies Teva and ResMed, a medical device manufacturer. And at the same time, Kerry dumped stock in the health insurance industry, which suffered greatly as a result of the passage of Obamacare. However, no example is worse or more appalling than that of former Representative Spencer Baucus. During the financial crisis of 2008, Baucus was a ranking member on the Financial Services Committee. And on September 18th, 2008, Baucus received a private briefing on the collapsing economy and financial system from none other than the chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time, Ben Bernanke, and the Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson. Armed with information that practically no one else knew about, what else could Bacchus possibly do with it? Well, he invested heavily in the market failing. Bacchus effectively shorted the market by buying options that would only rise if the market tanked. And a few days later, the market went down as anticipated and Bacchus nearly doubled his money. So in an attempt to clear up Congress's responsibility under the Exchange Act and a natural extension of the misappropriation theory, Congress passed what is known as the Stock Act. The Stock Act is short for the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act and was passed in April of 2012 during the presidency of Barack Obama. And it made it illegal for members of Congress to make investment decisions based on non-public information they obtain in their unique political positions. That is, you can't make trades in the stock market based on classified information received in meetings and briefings that were meant to aid politicians in making decisions for the good of the public. Now, prior to this act, the SEC held that government information had no connection with insider trading. Of course, you might say that as well if the people using this information were also the same people that controlled your funding. But this hugely bipartisan bill was supported by a vote of 96 to three. Only three senators voted against this act that would prohibit Congress from financially benefiting off of classified information. Of course, one of those three senators, ironically, was Senator Richard Burr, who, as we noted, is currently being accused of insider trading himself. You really can't make this up. So let's talk about the illustrious senator from the great state of North Carolina. Senator Richard Burr was recently privy to classified information about how potentially dangerous and devastating the coronavirus outbreak could be way before it was on the radar of any of us everyday folks in the United States. In addition to being a senator with access to significant amount of classified information on the coronavirus, Burr himself had a unique understanding of what was going on because of his role as the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the daily briefing on the coronavirus that he received. In fact, Burr might be considered something of an expert in biohazard threats and actually helped to write the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, which forms the framework for the federal response to the very situation that we're dealing with right now in terms of the coronavirus. So what did Burr do with this vital information and his unique expertise? Did he warn the public and ensure them that despite the administration's downplaying of the threat that the American public was aware of what was going on so that they could be prepared as best as possible? No, it doesn't doesn't seem so. It seems that around the time that Burr was first made aware of this information on potential future impact of the coronavirus, he sold off nearly $1.6 million of his stock's portfolio. 
In fact, on one day alone, February 13th, Burr sold personal stocks worth between $628,000 and $1.72 million in 33 separate transactions. To give you a frame of reference, that is the most stock he's sold in a single day in 14 months. His timing was, of course, impeccable as a week after Burr's sales, the stock market began a sharp decline and has lost at least 30% of its value ever since. And what makes this even more interesting is that not only did he sell a bunch of personal stocks at this time, large Large quantities of those sales were in industries that have been hit significantly hard by the pandemic, like $150,000 in the Wyndham Hotel and Resort stock, which has lost nearly two thirds of its value. In fact, Burr shared some of this inside information of dire economic and societal effects to only a select few in late February, while President Trump was actively downplaying any fears about COVID-19. This is a list of uh, the different countries. United States is rated number one, most prepared. On February 27th, Burr addressed a group at the Tar Heel Circle about the potential impact of the coronavirus. In addressing companies and organizations from North Carolina that donated more than $100,000 to his election campaign, Burr said, There's one thing that I can tell you about this. It is much more aggressive in its transmission than anything that we have seen in recent history. It's probably more akin to the 1918 pandemic. Every company should be cognizant of the fact that um, you may have to alter your travel. You may have to look at your employees and judge whether the trip they're making to Europe is essential or whether it can be done on video conference. Why risk it? Burr went on to say, there will be, I'm sure, times that communities, probably some in North Carolina, have a transmission rate where they say, let's close schools for two weeks. Everybody stay home. These statements were made 13 days before the U.S. State Department warned Americans against international travel and more than two weeks before North Carolina decided to close its schools. In an apparent attempt to defuse these allegations, a spokesman for Senator Burr stated, Senator Burr filed a financial disclosure form for personal transactions made several weeks before the U.S. and financial markets showed signs of volatility due to the growing coronavirus outbreak. The thing is, that's sort of what he's being accused of. It looks like he knew what was going to happen before a lot of other people did and then sold off the stocks. Whether he disclosed the sale later on isn't material to whether he traded on inside congressional information. By the way, I asked for recommendations for targeted and effective charities regarding the coronavirus on Twitter and you legal eagles did not disappoint. I wanted to highlight one of them here, the Gates Foundation COVID-19 Fund. They focus on vaccines, diet diagnostics and therapeutics, which are going to be necessary for ending this pandemic. In fact, there are several funds that you can choose from to get even more targeted. And the Gates Foundation has had a jump start on most of us since they started focusing on the coronavirus in January. And they have general expertise in global health and biomedical research. I'll drop a link in the description. I just gave $500. If you're in a position to give, I would really appreciate it if you could. But on to the next criminal, uh, I mean, Senator. Now, Senator Burr wasn't the only one potentially getting in on the action of trading on inside information. Another interesting case is that of newly appointed Senator Kelly Loeffler from Georgia, who is potentially the richest member in Congress right now. Loeffler, whose husband, Jeffrey Sprecher, is the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. She began aggressively selling equities on January 24th, the same day that she was present for an all Senate briefing conducted with the CDC director and officials from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Over the next few weeks, she and Sprecher sold stock to the tune of potentially $3 million. And it's important to note that from January 6th, when she was selected to take the place of Senator Isaacson, until the day of this coronavirus briefing, Loeffler had not made a single stock transaction. From that day through the middle of February, however, her household dumped seven figures worth of stocks in almost 30 separate transactions. Additional SEC filings showed that Sprecher sold an additional 3.5 million in shares of his own company, Intercontinental Exchange, on February 26th, which is also Loeffler's former employer. The power couple then went on to sell another 15.3 million shares in the same company on March 11th. And since the initial sale of their stock in Intercontinental Exchange, the company's stock prices almost dropped 25%. They then conveniently bought shares in Citrix, a company which makes teleworking software. At the same time, there have also been allegations against Senator Feinstein and Inhofe, who have been accused of dubiously selling large amounts of stocks in the weeks prior to the market's reaction to the coronavirus. Though Senators Feinstein and Inhofe were not in attendance of the all-Senate briefing on the coronavirus that Loeffler and Burr were present for. 
In addition, Senator Feinstein indicated that her investments are actually held in a blind trust that she has no control over or even any oversight. That being said, the timing of these trades still raises questions that should probably be investigated. We lose sight of this sometimes, but the mere appearance of impropriety shakes people's faith in our institution. But those are the allegations against the four senators, though really we're only hearing one side of the story, sourced largely from a Daily Beast article on this topic. But what are the potential defenses that these senators might have to raise against allegations of insider trading. Well, of course, you have the standard insider trading defenses, such as the fact that there was a disclosure prior to the use of the material information or a lack of knowledge that the material information was actually confidential. Other straightforward defenses can be used as well, like the argument that the person never actually had possession of material non-public information or the classic, my lawyer said it was okay defense. And courts have found insider trading did not occur when the transaction was part of a scheduled or predetermined trade plan. And we don't necessarily know what any of these particular senators had in terms of financial planning. There's actually a constitutional defense that may be made by members of Congress too, under what's known as the speech and debate clause. The text in the constitution says that for any speech or debate in either house, members of Congress shall not be questioned in any other place. That clause has been interpreted to provide a certain criminal and civil immunity for lawmakers when they're engaging in official legislative acts. That rule has been used by members of Congress to refuse to answer subpoenas, and it would be pretty likely that they would do so if the SEC attempts to investigate any of these allegations, particularly if it has to do with information that they received in briefings on the coronavirus. Now, the factual defenses that Burr and Loeffler have raised come from a couple of different angles. Loeffler simply contends that she simply didn't make the trades and that they were done by by a third party financial advisor. Uh, Loeffler defended herself uh, on Twitter by saying, this is a ridiculous and baseless attack. I do not make investment decisions for my portfolio. Investment decisions are made by multiple third party advisors without my or my husband's knowledge or involvement. As confirmed in the periodic transaction report to Senate ethics, I was informed of these purchases and sales on February 16th, 2020, three weeks after they were made. If you actually look at the personal transaction report, that were filed, it notices at the bottom that I'm only informed of my transactions after they occur several weeks. Also stated that the trades were part of a larger purchase that included a lot of stock that has subsequently gone down. There's a range of uh, different decisions made every day with regard to my savings and 401k portfolios that I'm not involved in. And certainly, uh, like any other trade, you, you can't see into the future. Burr, however, doesn't deny making the trades, but says he did so on public information and his general concern for the impact of the coronavirus. The specific statement he released stated, I relied solely on public news reports to guide my decision regarding the sale of stocks on February 13th. Specifically, I closely followed CNBC's daily health and science reporting out of its Asia bureaus at the time. Understanding the assumption many could make in hindsight, however, I spoke this morning with a chairman of the Senate Ethics Committee and asked him to open a complete review of the matter with full transparency. Now, it's possible both of these things could be a complete defense. If Loeffler can show that she never contacted the third parties who made the trades on her behalf, then it seems unlikely that they colluded in some fashion to trade on inside information. And if Burr can somehow show that he never used confidential information in making those trades, that might be a defense as well. But everyone has to sort of admit that the timing on these trades is highly suspicious. Now, if the allegations are true and the implications turn out to be correct, Burr and Loeffler put their portfolio above the safety and well-being of their fellow Americans that they were voted in to represent. And they would deserve more significant consequences than simply not being reelected. They would need to be held accountable for their actions. But beyond that, I think Congress needs to further rethink the restrictions on how they're allowed to invest in office. The situation also goes to show the benefit of having a blind trust. A valid argument could be made that congressmen and women should never be active investors, but really should only be allowed to be passively invested in ways in which they cannot gain from the use of their classified or non-public information. In a blind trust, the owner or trustor of the assets in theory has no knowledge of the specific stock holdings in the trust. The only control the trustor has over the trustee is to initiate the trust and to terminate it. But Having that blind trust would inoculate the senators from these kind of allegations that they profited over uh, classified information that they received. This would obviously be a burden to Congress people and senators, but you know, if you're elected to the highest deliberative body in the country, 
<laughs> you probably need to make some sacrifices in order to hold that office. But in an interesting coda to this whole thing, there are reports that the SEC will in fact investigate these transactions. So we actually may learn more about these suspicious trades after all. You would think that these Congress people would be better at business and wouldn't need to use classified information to make a buck at the public's expense. Instead of using their positions for personal gain, they should really take Michael Chernow's Skillshare class, Entrepreneurship Hustle, from business plan to real success. Michael would teach these senators how to find market opportunity, nail their business plan, pitch investors, align brand and culture, and measure success. You know, in a way that isn't dollars made shorting the market before the coronavirus shuts it down. And if they're committing insider trading because they're bad with money, they could always take Emily Simcox's Skillshare class, Bookkeeping for Freelancers, How to Handle Your Finances. Skillshare is an online learning community that has tens of thousands of classes on everything like music, design, technology, and business. A yearly membership is less than $10 per month, but the first 500 Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click using the link below. Plus, it really helps out this channel. It's a great way to learn just about anything when we're all stuck inside, going crazy, going crazy, going crazy, crazy, or going crazy. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things, all free for two months. So just click using the link in the description. Plus, clicking on the link really helps out this channel. Did I say that before? No, I'm, I'm not going crazy. Crazy. Do you agree with my grade? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other Real Law Reviews over here where I cover all of the coronavirus news of the day. So click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.